first keynote speaker. His name is Dick Hart. Anyone heard of him? Anyone seen him? He's genius. He's funny. He's both genius and funny. <laughs> Today he'll be talking about um, what is our identity, really, I guess. You know, what's a, what is our identity in this new Web 2.0 world? You know, are, are we, do we have an online identity? What's identity 2.0? All this kind of stuff. So, put your hands together for Dick Hart. Thanks, Jay. So, uh, Jay, on uh, Tuesday, when he uh, introduced Martin, Jonathan, and Berger, you know, they were all complaining because they all had only 30 minutes. <laughs> and uh, myself, I was kind of putting this away. Hey, you know, if I talk on Thursday, I get 45 minutes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. You know, and then last night, as I was finishing off my deck, I was thinking, maybe not so great. <laughs> I only have 15 minutes of material. <laughs> so, I said, stop playing with uh, Photoshop. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, all of these uh, photos, of course, were taken by uh, my buddy James David Duncanson. That's a photo of him, so now he can take a photo of me now, out here. Get a photo, get a photo. Oh, it's the dog. The dog. Pretend like I'm talking. Okay. How's that? <laughs> okay. okay. So I need to do that because you know these guys all like wandered around on the stage and talked, and I'm going to hide behind here because you're going to have to hang on as I rip through 11 and 24 slides in 39 minutes. As I talk about <laughs> I'm in pain killers, Viagra, identity, behavior, natives, the immigrants, future of the world, how it's complex, all the passwords, forms, and it's risky with all the spam and phishing and identity theft. Imagine a future that's simple, safe, and secure. I think that that future can happen with identity 2.0. So, what is identity? So what is identity? What is digital identity? What is identity 2.0? Why does it matter and where are we now? So, you know, you're probably wondering with the talk of the title of this talk being at a conference like this, by now you're wondering who is this dick? <laughs> you know, you know, he doesn't even know how to na say the name of the conference. So, and, you know, he thinks that this is a table. <laughs> but, you know, I think that, you know, as we look at all the data that's in the databases, you know, these types of tables, that it's really data that's about people. You know, and it's, it's really identity data. And I think that that's why this is important. So you understand what's happening with I identity, <clears throat> that's going to be what's happening it's in the, the data in your database. So what is identity? Well, it's a complicated topic. Often when you look at it, you really just see the tip of the iceberg. It's kind of like the elephant with all the blind men looking at it. And each person's perspective, they give a different idea around what the thing is. You know, an identity changes through our stages of life. And it's you know, different on your perspective. <laughs> Kind of the same thing, but not. <laughs> so what is identity? Well, you know, as any good member of the Digirati, when I want to know what something is, I ask Jim. And, uh, of course, it's Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. And so we'll start off with Google. And the first two hits there are a TV show and a movie, which is really not all that useful for us. So we're going to go through, cross off the ones that are relevant, circle all the good ones and see what Yahoo has to say, they don't do so well. And then see what Microsoft says, well, we're not a very good start, but a bunch of good things there at the end. So, you know, we look at our score, how do they do? You know, Google, Microsoft, they're about the same, Yahoo, yeah, I mean, not so well. You know, that's why they're getting bought. <laughs> Kim Cameron's blog, and you know, Kim Cameron's identity web blog, of course, Kim's at Microsoft, and at the Microsoft search, well, number two was a link to my talk. I was very happy about that. Number 10 was a link to my company. So it seems that Google thinks that Microsoft knows what identity, and Microsoft thinks that Skip knows what identity is. <laughs> so what about Wikipedia? You know, that's the place that, you know, really has the answer. <clears throat> we look up on Wikipedia, and there's, you know, not an awful lot really about identity. It's really a lot of links in other places. 
And recently I was in uh, Germany and I wonder why, I wonder what the Germans think identity is, you know, like at the tap. And, um, you know, they're, they're uh, German. <laughs> <laughs> So even though I have a German name, I don't speak German, so that wasn't too helpful. But it's interesting. <laughs> and then after that, I was over in Dutch, which, you know, they always make a lot of fun of German. <laughs> and I was thrilled to see that they, identity tour was a reference in their definition of identity, you know? And, you know, they had a, a page there that talked about it, so, so that was very exciting. But it really didn't answer the question, so to answer the question, I went to answers.com, and they had a good answer. As identity being the collective aspect of the set of characteristics for which a thing is definitively recognizable or known, or the set of behavioral or personal characteristics by which an individual is recognizable as a member of a group. So what is identity? Well, identity enables you to separate me, this dick, from all these other dicks that are out there. <laughs> this one being one of my favorites. <laughs> because he has his own action figure. <laughs> so, uh, identity enables you to go and pick this dick, you know, the dick you want, out of all the other dicks. And identity is also about personas. You know, there's lots of different personas about me, and anyone that's worked with me or dated me knows that. <laughs> and uh, we won't go into more detail right now. Um, but women really are the masters of different personas. They're different outfits, hairstyles, accessories, makeup. And a good example, depending on how you define good, is uh, Madonna, who's a wife, mother, athlete, but definitely a performer who has reinvented herself numerous times over her illustrious career. Identity also enables you to predict behavior. And you'll notice that I am Canadian, so you can predict how I will spell behavior. <laughs> This is how it's spelled. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's different professionals, like a veterinarian, fireman, policeman, no, this is a fireman, soldier, ballerina, lifeguard, nurse, elbows and person, or chef. All these different professionals have different roles. They're not a unique identity. When you see them, you think about someone in that role, they have a certain identity because of how they're dressed and how they're acting, the circumstances your past experience and prior knowledge of interacting with these people enables you to predict their behavior. Of course, when you see this guy belting out a Madonna tune, that new experience changes the identity of this guy. <laughs> but is this identity? Well, identity is who you are. So who am I? Well, if you don't know Dick, this is me. Dick Clarence Hart, it's my email, phone, my blogs, I'm male in case that wasn't obvious. This is when I'm born. I'm still 44. Soon to change. I'll have to edit the slide. It makes me over 19, over 21, over 25, under 65. I'm Canadian from Canada. And so from you Americans, this is where Canada is. <laughs> and you guys wonder why we get confused. <laughs> You guys are the ones confused. <laughs> so, I, I know, this has something to do with whether you're laying with this guy or this guy. As a Canadian, I think you should get this guy. <laughs> so I live in the province of BC, city of Vancouver. It looks like this from the sky, courtesy of Google. We have the Olympics coming up, which is causing its own identity problems. I live in part of Vancouver called Gastown right there. I went to UBC, started a company, uh, Hip Communications where I worked on pointing Pearl over the windows. And uh, then I founded Accuracy with my friends at O'Reilly. And we were all happy because we had an exit at the end of the day. And I took all my money and I put it into this company where I'm the CEO and I'm founder and the board member and to lots of my staff, I'm also the bartender. <laughs> I uh, invested in uh, Flickr and was on their board, which you know was a nice exit to Yahoo. I belong to these organizations. I fly on this airline a lot, which makes me start land school, which is really important <laughs> when you're checking in. But identity is also what I like. You know, I really liked the, the Grizzlies until they got sold. 
I really like the Canucks, well, at least for one game, because they tend to lose. <laughs> um, these are books that I identify with, magazines that I read, movies that I identify with. This is the kind of gear I like, this is what I like to wear, this is what I like to drive. I'm into open source, yay open source. Yay! yay. <laughs> okay. Yoga, okay. ultimate, auto race and snowboarding. So that's me, that's my identity. So to summarize, identity enables you to uniquely identify somebody. You can have different personas grouping your information in different ways. There's things that, you know, about you that you like. There's things that other people say about you, you know, as a professional or, or that are authoritative about statements about you. So how is it conveyed? Well, historically, it's been verbal where you trusted the person. And then we had things like hats and abilities. If anyone that saw a nice tale knows those could be for it. So we had official papers that enable trust on the local somebody like that one. Okay. The one person who saw the nice tale. Uh, <laughs> so modern day, local skills, so, but modern identity is around photo ID, passports, driver's license, student cards, and yes, there are a number of Easter bunnies in those. Enable trust on a global scale so that I could prove that this is me, that I'm Canadian, that I live here, I went to UCM, I'm over 21. So where is identity used? Well, it's identity transactions. I know, you database guys, you're, ooh, transaction, there's a word I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not those kinds of transactions. So, identity transactions, you know, party identification, you know, who is it that you're dealing with? The next one is authorization, you know, are they allowed to do something, you know? Next one is profile exchange, you know, information about that person, you know, so you know them better. And then people often consider record matching to be an identity transaction, but it's not. That's, that's sort of core database. Is this record the same as this record? It doesn't matter whether it's people or not. So identity transactions can be verbal. You meet the person, you talk to them, or you talk to them on the phone, but it's an unverified transaction. You need to trust the person you're, you're interacting with. Well, what about a verified example? Well, a familiar one is you go in a place like this where you need to be over 21, you walk up to the cashier, they ask for some ID. Now, you have some choice. Do you want to present ID? You just say no, roll back the transaction. <laughs> <laughs> which ID? So you can choose which one of these things gets you in. And so say I'll choose my uh, driver's license. So they'll look for the you know, person in front of them and the credential and they see, yep, that matches. And so the person's got that, the subject matches the credential. But the feature that in theory I, I can use that credential. And then they'll see, you know, the information, go back, information about it. Where's my slide? Oh, I don't know what it's doing. Anyway, all the stuff is valid, assuming you trust the province of BC. And then they look to see the information on the credential, and they see, yeah, 63, this person's definitely over 21. And it's authorized to buy their bottle of vanilla stoli, which uh, every once in a while someone sends me a bottle of vanilla stoli, so if you're generous sometimes, feel free. <laughs> So, photo ID has significantly reduced the friction of identity transactions, and photo ID is asymmetrical in trust, and that there's no relationship between the province and the cashier, which provides a lot of scalability. And since the province is not a participant in an identity transaction, a lot of privacy. They don't know when you're using this thing. And that credential is reusable. You know, I can use it, and I can give it to any recipient who trusts the issue, in this case, the province of BC. So that's just one example of an identity transaction, and I'm going to give a little identity story to sort of give you an idea around how many identity transactions we have in our life. But I'm going to have to have you make believe a little bit here, because I'm going to go through Jane Gujarati's story, and you know, Jane's kind of going to have the ideal thing that Jane isn't going to change all the way through the story, which women would really like, but we know none of that's realistic. So here's Jane, age six. <laughs> and, uh, you know, elementary school, this is a first big transaction. She has to provide a number of things. At 16, she gets a driver's license, and she gets a bank account, a credit card, a phone. At 18, she applies to go to school. She gets a student loan. She gets her first computer. At 21, she decides to go to Mexico to have fun. She needs to get her passport, an airline ticket. At 22, she gets into med school. You know, kind of a complicated identity transaction. Does she go and apply to college of physicians and surgeons, they need to check your criminal record check on her. She gets her own place, so she needs to get hydro and cable. At 24, she becomes a healthcare worker, they need to do even more checks on her to make sure she can do that. She purchases her first car, she gets auto insurance. Fortunately, a year later, she gets in an auto accident, she ends up in an emergency where she has to identify herself. 
and she was doing it on work, and so she has to do a bunch of other things to go and make a claim, and then she has to go through a rehab and go and identify herself. At 26, she gets into doing some medical research. She graduates. She starts a new business. She has a medical practice. She opens up a corporate bank account. She does some continuing ed, and then something sad happens, and one of her grandparents is in the hospital. She you know, takes over custody, and you know, the inevitable happens, and the grandparent dies, and Jane needs to deal with the estate. But she meets a nice guy, they decide to get married, so she gets a marriage license, a liquor license, they have a great party, she changes her name, she changes her address, they purchase a home, she gets a mortgage, unfortunately it doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a life, there's an awful lot of claims and identity data that's happening throughout all these types of things, you know, and genes as a consumer, this is in the enterprise space, this is in the government space, but they're all based around her, what she's doing. So what is digital identity? Well, you can sometimes view it as site registration. You know, it's the stuff that you fill in in all these different forms. Yeah. Definitely a hassle. Could be simpler. We have some technology that does that. <laughs> um, but is it digital identity? Well, it's unverified. It's like the verbal identity. But there's fewer trust cues because you can't see the person. You can't hear the person. You can't talk to the person. In fact, you don't even know if it's the person that's filling in the form. <laughs> what if you take my name and you give it to Google? Well, you know, here's the first page hit, you see my blog, professional blog, my personal blog, you know, you get to my site, my team, and then there's a, my entry on Wikipedia. It's all in the top five hits there. If you go to Delicious and search for the keyword, you know, there's things people have thought as Dick Hart. In Flickr, there's a bunch of photos that have been tagged Dick Hart, which I always find interesting to look at as I see photos that I didn't do, like this one. It's like, how do they know it was even me? <laughs> <laughs> so these are all digital records, but what's the authority? I don't know. So what about username and password? Are this digital identity? Well, besides the fact that passwords are an unnatural act, we weren't really meant to do this. <laughs> And, you know, this username, what do you really know? <laughs> That's what you learn from that. It's really authentication that proves that I am a directory entry. This is identity 1.0. It's directory centric. There's a single authority. There's no credential choice. It's not portable. It's a silo. How do we mimic the real world? Where is my digital driver's license? How do I prove that I am Canadian? I live here. I'm over 21. I went to UBC and CEO. Skip by Danny and Star Alliance Gold. How do I prove I am online? It's not possible today. Verified digital identity is not what you give to the site, but what the website knows about you. So your eBay reputation, which you build up over time, but can you take that over to Craigslist? Is it your reputation or their reputation? It's clothes. It's a walled garden. Well, there's a clock that tells me how much time I have. Cool. Um, <laughs> so these are all silos. All the data is in all these different silos. It's site-centric, you know. Site's in the middle. It's identity one though. What we want is really something user-centric, where the user is in the middle, and the user can move their identity data from any site to any site, and they'll have identity 2.0. So what is identity 2.0? Well, to understand identity 2.0, we kind of need to understand what was identity 1.0. It's a little history. Identity management in the 90s in the enterprises, they had multiple applications and employee profiles and usernames and passwords and access control, all of this stuff spread around. So you got three different applications, each with their own storage. And what they wanted was a single directory, single sign-on, centralized provision. So it was pretty simple. They took those storage places and they put them all in one place. And then they used LDAP as a protocol to connect them. Pretty straightforward. It was all centralized, a domain-centric model. Identity 1.0 had arrived. Then they started looking at problems around, well, maybe not everybody that's working on the apps is in the same organization. So we have different apps with different data in different organizations. You can't really take the directories and put them in one place. It doesn't really work for everybody. It doesn't work for anybody, in fact. And so what they do is they sort of make it all look like it's one kind of big directory that's kind of sharing stuff around. Sort of like a bunch of silos connected together. <clears throat> And they create a circle of trust, you know, the federation around all this stuff around what they're doing. I call this Identity 1.5. But let's extrapolate around where it's going. And we worked on a project with the uh, province of BC with all these people where the goal was really how do we get the right information to the right person at the right time? And they had a citizen-centric view of the world. So you've got the photos here suck, right? I mean, it's just looking down here. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so, you know, we're talking about all the things that Jane did Girardi need to do. A bunch of those were with the government. And so if you take the first approach around, you know, with the citizen interacting with the ministry, well, that works with the silo approach. You can do a siloed approach and you got them, you know, they can all share. But you start adding the broader public sector and the private sector, which are all parts of delivering these services. And then you start looking at all these professionals and all the different parts of the organization you need to work with. I mean, they end up with these credentials and identities across all of these different places. And it's just a zoo. And then it's not a problem just in BC, you know, but, you know, those same people may be working over in the province of Alberta, which is, you know, in Canada as well. <laughs> so, or, or any of the other provinces in Canada, looks like this. So, you know, but those people can be working across North America, which is where you guys are. You know, or anywhere else in the world, which you're part of as well. <laughs> so, but the, the circle of trust that was needed in that federation model just does not scale to the globe. We need a new model, Identity 2.0. So at the province, you know, with their mission of making this the best place on earth, decided to go and get us all to go and work on solving this problem. And, um, you know, I, I led this project and literally it was like herding cats trying to get these people in the same place because it was like the elephant in the room and everybody had a completely different idea around what they were trying to do. But eventually we got everybody fairly aligned. We came up with this architecture. It's a user-centric architecture, which is available on their site. There's a link off my site. So what is this Identity 2.0 thing? You know, well, in Identity 1.0 we had centralizing the data um, into one place, which solved that problem. And then 1.5 came along, it's like, okay, we'll kind of pretend that maybe we share it and we set up a little circle of trust with our silos. But, you know, that, that as I said, isn't going to scale. So what we do is we go and we take all the issuers, we put them on one side. And then we have, you know, an identity agent, which is representing the user, we put them in the middle. And then the user goes and gets their data from whoever's making statements about them and then is able to go and give that data to any relying party, any site that would like to go and see that data. And how the user proves themselves to their agent is using some kind of, say, stronger authentication. They move the results of that strong off to the relying party. So instead of having a bunch of weak passwords at every website, and maybe some of them are a little bit stronger, you can have one really strong way around how you authenticate to your agent you can use a lot of different technologies. What works best for you for how do you authenticate to your agent? So this is a key feature, so I'm going to go over it one more time, <laughs> that you know, we can go and have a strong authentication and move the results of the strong authentication to the relying party. So the agent could be any trusted site, you know, any of these guys, if you trust them, keyword there. Um, could be your school, could be your employer, could be your bank, could be your government. Could be a trusted app like InfoCard, or you know, we've got something that's moving down that road. <laughs> the issuers, whoever is authority for that identity. UBC knows whether I went to school there or not. Skip knows whether I work there. Canada knows where I'm Starland's gold. The Canadian government knows that I'm Canadian. Province BC knows my name and date of birth. And so you see, we've got all these things on. So you're left. And as the, you know, there are all the claims that I get, and then I can go and send them to any relying party. And that relying party can really be any site that I want to share any of this information with. Now, in this model, you'll notice it doesn't require any trust between the issuer and the agent, or between the relying party and the agent. But of course, there is trust between the relying party and the issuer, because of course, the relying party is making a statement, and the issuer is making a statement, and the relying party is trusting it. But that's a unidirectional thing. This model provides a lot of scale, right? And it's a user-centric model. And it has a lot of privacy because the acquisition of the claim is separated from the presentation of the claim. So the people that are making statements about me don't know where I'm using those, similar to my driver's license. So these user-centric technologies are all emerging. You know, we have InfoCard and OpenID coming out with support from these guys. And OpenID is a URI, you know, something that I may, I may already have. And this year, we've had Google and Yahoo roll out support for OpenID. So you're kind of wondering, like, OK, so how does this map into the title of the talk? Well, at LinkedIn, you know, this is my profile. At Plaxo, this is my profile. Right? This, is, this is who the dick is at the site. The Twitter, this is the Flickr here, Doppler, Facebook. 
But the question is, um, you know, who is this guy really? Right? I mean, the, the, all these things are in silence. Well, you know, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook <laughs> is, um, <coughs> you know, I am addicted. Isn't that the first step, admitting it? Um, <laughs> You know, a lot of stuff is starting to get integrated into, into Facebook, right? So, you know, my Twitters are now in Facebook. My Flickr stuff is integrated in Facebook. My Doppler is integrated in Facebook. And, you know, Jeff's probably not going to be, Jeff, Jeff's hiding somewhere around here. So it's down there. Yeah, he's probably not going to be too happy with this slide. But, um, you know, Facebook's becoming the big silo, the new silo, where all the stuff is there. And I really want it to be open. And so, you know, URIs enable me to have it open because of LinkedIn, I've got a URI, and a Twitter, I've got a URI, and a Flickr, I've got a URI, and a Doppler, I've got a URI, and a Facebook, I've got a URI. <laughs> <laughs> and a Plaxo, which is, you know, the huge supporters of this, I've got a URI. You know, and that's memorable, for sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, and using rel equals me, you know, which is sort of a, a model that may emerge to do it, I can link all of these different identifiers, essentially, who I am across different sites, and I can link them over into my blogs. I can link them into my profile and link back my profile on my site, and maybe someday I'll even be able to link my Wikipedia entry into them. can't do that today, since I'm not allowed to edit it. And um, maybe, maybe somebody can make me there for me. <laughs> Uh, so that answers the question for you guys as, as database managers. You know, it helps you figure out like, well, who is the dick on your, your site? You know, and you you know got all these tables of data, but you know, it's really about a person. You know, what this data is. If this isn't just any kind of data. It's not your data, in fact, in some ways, right? And you know, Jonathan had you know talked a lot on Tuesday about open, about open source, about open standards, about open data, about how it was your data in order to, you know, you make sure you it was your data that you needed all these other things to be open. But, you know, to me, it's still going in a silo. Right? It's not my data. I want my data. Right? How do I get my data out of that? You know, I want to be in the middle. So, you know, data portability is helping make that happen. You know, maybe, I think, by Friday, they'll know what their logo is. So I had to put them all up here. <laughs> have a little contest. Vote for whichever one you like up at TechCrunch. And, um, you know, which is sort of really a user-centric approach that puts me in the middle. It enables me as a user to move my identity from any site to any site. And that starts to enable us to have a, a digital world where I have credentials that enables me to go and prove that I'm Canadian, that I live here. I'm over 21. I went to UBC, I'm CEO of Skip Identity, I'm Star Alliance Gold. And this has applications in the consumer space, the enterprise space, and the government space. So like any new technology, you know, it can be scary. That's a scary picture of me. I'm scared. You know, it could be utopia or dystopia. You know, look at email. It was a killer app of the internet, but look at all the problems we're having with it as well. Right? So, you know, we've got to be careful around, you know, the prophecies of surveillance and of opaque policies. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of awareness around this from the designers of, you know, um, whatever this text called, InfoCars and OpenID and you know, Kim Cameron really had a good set of information as laws of identity. So why does all this stuff matter? I still got 12 minutes, holy cow. <laughs> um, well, let's look forward 10 years. And, and how I predict the future is, you know, one of my favorite authors and also somebody else, Canadian from Vancouver, uh, has a, a quote, you know, the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So what is that unevenly distributed future? Well, obviously, high-speed bandwidth is, 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 is getting widely distributed. More and more applications are moving up in the sky and becoming distributed. Our data is becoming digital. Storage is becoming cheap. Biometrics are starting to become prevalent. You know, when you go through Nexus now, you know, it just scans your eyes. This is what I do when I go back to Canada. They just look at my eye have to talk to some American guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I can pay now with, you know, whipping the card around. I don't have to wipe it through, something like that, you know, with, the, with that stuff. These types of things, these are disappearing. They're all turning into these. 
right? And these are like you're going to be turning into these, <laughs> right? You know, this is, you know, the J phone, you know. <laughs> That slide's probably going to get me in the same trouble as that slide is. <laughs> but, you know, you know with, with things like this, we really see a lot of device convergence. You know, so, you know, the payment integrated in the phone, near-field communication, you, know, you get the phone number, the URL, you do payments, you get Bluetooth handshakes, you know, you go and get tickets, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, what's happening in 2018? Well, We've got the digital natives. Will be a majority of the workforce. Think about that. The guys that grew up with us. So what the heck are these digital natives? Well, some of you probably know. And they're sort of differentiated by a number of us that are digital immigrants. And Mark Pensy came up with the term. So a native is somebody that grew up with a computer and the internet. And they learn their computer in many ways before they really even learned to read and write. And an immigrant, well, you can always spot an immigrant. They have an accent. This thing? An immigrant, that's a digital camera. A native, it's just a camera. The folder, <laughs> immigrant, native. <laughs> Applications, immigrant, native. <laughs> An immigrant's news source, there we go. The native, man, these guys, right? They think that's news. I think it's news. <laughs> so, what's the world look like in 2018? Well, you know, I'll look a little older. God let me like that stuff yet. Uh, this guy will be serving his third term as your president. <laughs> to get as many unlikely things together as possible. But seriously, I've got some identity to our predictions. Okay, here it is. This is the second bullet list. Minimal passwords, rich portable profiles, portable credentials, agency and delegation, reputation services, and identity services. So minimal passwords. So we start to have strong mechanisms of, of authenticating to our agent. We're going to have a lot less passwords around how we do that and how we talk to the relying party. That's going to help reduce phishing, complexity of passwords. And the device convergence is going to go and integrate all these pieces together so it's much simpler as to how do you authenticate. We're going to have rich profiles. So doing things like this is going to be like pressing the easy button. <laughs> and we're going to be able to move really rich information, and we're going to be able to manage it in different personas, right? So what I have in LinkedIn and Orchid and MySpace and Facebook is all different. We'll have portable credentials. You know, we'll have our digital drivers, digital driver's license. You know, that can prove things about us, prove whether we're a professional, prove attributes ourselves, and solve all the problems that Jane had in her life as she was trying to go improve them. She'll be able to do those things digitally. We'll have agency and delegation. So that my assistant, when she's booking a flight for me in Air Canada, I don't have to go and give her my username and password. She can do that on my behalf. Or that if I'm going to a site and I want to go and you know, suck up data from a number of other sites, I don't have to give that site my username and password for Flickr and Delicious and LinkedIn and Plaxo. And it'll be scoped by functionality like read-only or temporary like only today. And some of this is starting to come available with the OAuth spec. And we'll have reputation services like the blogosphere, like being able to so prove your page rank, or that you've been a significant contributor in open source, or that you're a great contributor to wikis, or you know, in many ways it's kind of like the same as a credit rating. Could be the same in some day. But myself, I'm really looking forward to being able to prove that I'm human, so I don't have to type these things anymore. <laughs> And then we have some interesting identity services, disposable email, one-time postal addresses, one-time phone numbers, one-time payment <laughs> numbers. We have these one-time tokens so that instead of giving out our, our real personal identifying information, we have this layer of indirection when we make payments, which can help significantly help reduce fraud. And disposable email, so instead of me handing this out or this out, I can hand something like this out, which is pretty opaque, which can help reduce spam and significantly improve my privacy. So where are we now? Well, there's going to go through a bit of this, what's the state of user-centric identity, which kind of calls mine the state of the union for you Americans about your president's always coming up and telling the world about what's going to happen. He's very happy with himself here. <laughs> of course, us Canadians kind of wonder what the state of the union would look like if the map, looked, instead of looking like this, looked like this. <laughs> That'd be a different state of the union. 
So, state of user-centric identity. So, a little history. You know, back in 2005 at the Burton Group, Tim Cameron rolled out his laws of identity, which you know, a lot of people were pretty interested in. And I gave one of my first talks on identity to him. And when the people were looking at me, I think they thought I was smoking crack. <laughs> you know? And they did just like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Then I tuned it up a little bit and gave it at another O'Reilly conference. And that one went a little over a little bit better. We've had over 600,000 downloads of that one, so I ain't smoking crack anymore. <laughs> so, so what's the state of user centric identity? Well, we can, in order to look at this, we need to look at the industry standards, interop, deployment, utilization. So I got a little report card to see what the state is. It says score ourselves. It's not my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we're also going to look at vitamins, painkillers, and Viagra, you know, where vitamins is something that you know you should take, but you usually don't. Painkillers, you don't want to take it, but you take it when you got a pain, but other than that, you don't want to take it. Viagra, hey, you're excited to take Viagra. Let's do new things. <laughs> so, this is in the sexual connotation. I'm talking about drug, and it's a drug analogy. Okay. <laughs> So in 2007, you know, Microsoft rolled out uh, InfoCard, IBM rolled out their synonymous uh, Itemix technology, Credentia rolled out their U-Proof, Symantec announced a big project they were going to have around an identity agent, did all kinds of cool stuff. AOL supported OpenID at the RSA conference, a bunch of people announced support for OpenID, making it more efficient resistant. Sun gave a sun.com OpenID to everyone that was a Sun employee. You didn't get one if you were a contractor, but if you're a Sun employee, you got one. And then these guys all started supporting uh, OpenID. And at this conference, there was a big intro where people got a bunch of different software together to make sure it all played together. At that one, Microsoft rolled out their new logo for InfoCard, you know, which is a little bit of color art, turns into another whale. <laughs> and uh, another dick. <laughs> that was a joke, too. <laughs> Uh, OAuth 1.0 got final, OpenID 2.0 got finalized in 2008. All of these guys joined the OpenID Foundation as uh, significant board members or something like sustaining members. Microsoft acquired Cadentica, which sort of solved the IPR issues around that privacy enhancing technology. Data portability sort of is taking off. Uh, O'Reilly uh, hosted the Social Graph Boot Camp, you know, where you know this kind of stuff was, was rolled out. So what's our report card, looking at all this stuff? Well, in the industry, got a bunch of different people that are unlikely to get together easily, working together. On interop, people got a fair amount of the technology working, even though standardization wasn't quite there. You know, we could, you know, OpenID 2.0 is out, but, you know, frankly, it's a bit of a Frankenstein, I can say that, being one of the editors. So, you know, there's definitely some things that need to be improved. Still work on WSR, claim standards, claim schemas, like what are the things we're moving around? And deployment, well, there's some WSR that's rolling out in some government places. Open ID in the consumer space, you know, there's a number of people supporting it. Uh, info cards, well, there's only one place that really takes them in a consumer place now. And enterprise, well, really not much stuff. And there's not really a lot of people that are issuing claims, you know, creating the stuff that I want to move around and prove to other things. And utilization, really it's nominal. So if you're familiar with the model of, you know, uh, Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm where we've got our market segments and we have our technology enthusiasts and visionaries and pragmatists and conservatives and skeptics, there's this big chasm. Um, User-centric identity isn't even there. I think it's right there still. So functionality, you know, there's nothing I've got out there that enables me to go improve that I'm Canadian, but I live here, I'm over 21, I went to UCNCO, skip identity, and start Lions Gold. So we're really still at the tip of the iceberg. So our report, report card, I give the industry an A on working together, C on standards, a B on interop, C on deployments, a D on utilization, probably should be an F. And there are some other issues, right? So info cards, besides being a bit of a whale, you know, has some portability issues because it's kind of based on keys, you know, with keys, and if you lose the key, well, you have no idea how many keys there are. And it only deals with one card in the transaction. Open ID, phishing issues, geeky UI. Who wants to type in a URL everywhere you go? And some performance. You know, when you click on the button, you know, eventually it all comes back. 
And then there's identifier control, right? So, you know, I've got these different identifiers. But if I want to keep those identifiers, I've got to keep paying the man money every year to own those domain names. And what happens when I die, right? Somebody else gets them. They can be me. i got to, you know, I'm not sure what's going to go happen. So in our vitamins, painkillers, and Viagra story, you know, it's kind of a nice thing to still the vitamin stage. It's not really solving any pain and we're long ways away from it being Viagra. What's going to be happening in 2009? Well, I think info cards are going to start to see some enterprise trials, maybe open ID, definitely more consumer deployment, consumer utilization. I don't know. I think that uh, we're going to move up the curve a bit, but still not across the chasm, and our report cards are going to look like that. But, you know, I mean, think I'm still smoking crack. <laughs> so, to someone not know what crack is? <laughs> so to summarize, identity is a complicated issue. It's really the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're looking and you're talking to people, it's an elephant. And everybody has a different idea around what it is. You know, it's different depending on your perspective of things. But identity enables you to identify somebody, you have different personas, there's a lot of information about you. And it maps in the consumer, the enterprise, and the government space. The natives are changing the world, leading to making it happen. We've got a number of technologies rolling out. The big boys are jumping on board. The projects are there. A number of relying parties are there. But this is where we are currently in the curve. Our report card isn't so good. We anticipate a bunch of device convergence, ha device convergence happening. But on the internet today, it's still very complex with all the passwords, forms, and it's risky with all the spam and phishing and identity theft. And identity 2 is going to enable us to have digital credentials and enable me to prove that I'm Canadian, I live here, I'm over 21, I'm a UPCN CEO of Skip Identity and Star Alliance Gold, and we can have a future with minimal passwords, rich profiles, portable credentials, agency, reputation services, identity services, and a world that's simple, safe, and secure, and hopefully some Viagra. So, <laughs> all that was some identity 2.0. Thank you.